Lou Brissy's story is one of incredible mental strength, physical toughness, medical history, and honestly, after nearly being left for dead on the battlefield, pure random luck. Today I'm joined by my friend Mike, the sports history collector. Mike has his own video on Lou Brissy that I hope you check out. But before I bring in Mike, I don't want to bury the lead. I want you to understand right up front what makes Lou Brissy's story so darn interesting. The world changed when Pearl Harbor was attacked, and Lou did what so many young men did in that era. He enlisted in the U.S. Army. Lou would end up as a squad leader in the U.S. Army's 351st Infantry 88th Division, fighting the Germans in the mountains of northern Italy. The 88th was in the thick of it. By December of 1944, Lou and the 88th had been in Italy for more than a year and suffered an un unbelievably high 90% casualty rate. After two weeks of being dug in in a cold, frozen foxhole, Lou caught a truck to get a hot meal. On his way back to the front, the convoy of trucks was hit by 170mm artillery. These 170mm artillery shells are like bombs when they hit the ground. The German 17cm cannon fired a 62.6 kilogram shell, that's 138 pounds, at 3,000 feet per second with a range of up to 18 miles. Uh, this was a, a vicious war gun. The noise was incredible as the earth all around Lou basically exploded. Uh, Lou was slammed to the ground, his helmet knocked off, the buttons on his, on his coat popped off, his entire body uh, felt like he had been hit by lightning. Lou found that he couldn't move his left leg, and when he looked, it looked shredded below the knee. He dragged himself on his elbows 20 yards through the snow to a creek, blood streaming from his nose and his ears, and he blacked out on the bank of the creek. Face down in the mud and snow, he lay there for eight hours. When Army corpsmen came through the area on what was commonly called the, quote, grave registration team, a soldier saw something out of the corner of his eye, and he yelled, Hey, this one moved. They put Lou on a stretcher and carried him to a nearby Jeep. Lou was strapped across the hood of the Jeep as they tried to get him to medical care. The Jeep was on its way, rushing to the aid station, when... A second German attack of 88 millimeter mortars landed just in front of the speeding Jeep, sending shrapnel into Lou's shoulder. The driver swerved off the road, and Lou was thrown from the Jeep. His head hit a rock, giving him a severe concussion, and he broke some vertebrae. Believe it or not, this is the good luck I referred to earlier. It doesn't sound lucky, but Lou somehow managed to escape death twice. That said, the injuries were very serious. At least 21 mortar fragments were in his shoulder, leg, hands, and torso. His left leg, uh, the tibia and fibula, were broken, um, actually shattered, said to be in 30 pieces. Both feet were broken. His left ankle was broken. Contusions in both thighs, fractured vertebrae, as I said, and concussion. The immediate response by the doctors was that Lou's leg could not be saved, and they wanted to amputate it. It was a mess of artillery, shrapnel, and shattered bone fragments, and it just wasn't savable. The surgeon explained to Lou uh, what was going to happen, and, and Lou refused. Um, he begged the surgeon. He said, the surgeon said, you will die if we don't amputate this leg. And Lou said, I'll take my chances. His whole life, he only wanted to do one thing, play baseball. Okay, before I go any further, let's get Mike in here. So I had read this book. This is his biography. The Corporal Was a Pitcher by Ira Burkow, and that's his 52 tops that they used as the cover image. After reading the book, I was, I was just stunned by his story, and I, I was determined that I was going to do a video on him. So I started to do, do research, and uh, I stumbled on your video. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "No, Mike already did a video. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to repeat something you've already done." But I, I can't do even. Think, 
Pardon? I can't even tell you. How, I can't even tell you how many times that's happened to me, where it's like uh, no one's heard of this player, and then I just go to look and see if maybe there's some interviews out there on YouTube, and I'll see like four or five other channels have done, you know, eight years ago, five years ago, three years ago. It's like, oh, well, maybe it's due for a new one. <laughs> that's that's kind of how I feel. I mean, if there's two Lou Brissy videos on YouTube from you and I over the last eight months, then so be it. Uh, everyone's got a different take, you know, and, and different style and stuff. And I, you know, it's like watching, um, two different biographies on, you know, on a player or a person and stuff. You get a little, little different and I enjoy all of them. So yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I wanted to, to know what it was that attracted you to Lou Brissy's story. How did you come to hear about him? And well, my process is kind of the same for everybody. What I do is um, I, I really like those 51 and 52 Bowman cards and also 49s. But since I'm trying to collect the 51 and 52s, I try to stay with those. And then I've just been going through and trying to see what cards are available that are signed of, of any player. And then I start doing research on all the players I can. Uh, he happened to come up and... Uh, he had quite a lot of information about him, um, and it was an interesting story. You talked in your video. You had mentioned the stat. I think he he had something like forty blood transfusions and thirty something surgeries. I'll have to go back. Yeah, and look. it was uh, twenty three surgery major surgeries, and I think it was forty blood transfusions. Which is um, considering he was in the military, I, I can't even imagine today them doing that. Uh, he was the first player in the Mediter Mediterranean theater, um, which included Italy, where he was, I guess, to, to be given penicillin. Pretty much kind of kind of a trial type thing. It wasn't uh, it wasn't a thing they did all the time. It was pretty new, apparently. Yeah, that's surprising to me. I didn't know that penicillin, I guess I didn't realize that it was that relatively recent. Just kind of take it for granted today. I, I thought it was earlier than that myself, but and that's why I, I love doing the kind of research and stuff. You learn stuff, and I mean, maybe it doesn't do anything for your everyday life today or anything, but it, it's interesting to me. Without penicillin, he wouldn't have had a chance. And um, penicillin and uh, the doctor who would attempt the many surgeries uh, that would be required to save Lou's leg, Doctor Wilbur Brubaker was the guy's name. He operated on, on Lou's leg five times in the first four months, carefully wiring bone fragments together and removing as much shrapnel as he could. Dr. Brubaker said the longest intact piece of bone in Lou's lower leg was only four inches. The rest were all just bone pieces. In the end, Lou would endure a phenomenal 23 major leg operations and 40 blood transfusions. He also had operations on his shoulder, both hands, his feet, and his thighs. His left leg would end up three quarters of an inch shorter than his right and would require constant care and treatment. He would forever have pain in that leg, and he just had to learn to tolerate it. But he did, and it was a year before he could walk uh, with a cane. And somehow, with limited mobility, he would end up back on the mound. He says, in fact, in his, his biographer, that, that he considered himself lucky, which is hard to hard to imagine going through what he went through and considering yourself lucky. But I think when you've had or seen friends and, and fellow soldiers die right in front of you, yeah. you consider yourself lucky. Well, a lot of, a lot of things, yeah, that, that is especially, um, I would consider myself lucky if that had happened, that... Um, the shell that hit uh, actually hit pretty close to him, which sounds like bad, but they said that if it had actually hit the ground a little further away, the way those um, shells work is they blow apart and then go up so that he probably would have been hit above the knee anywhere. And, you know, Chet probably might've killed him. So considering that he was pretty lucky in that regard as well. As bad as Lou's injuries were, he didn't have to look far to see worse. But the first thing I did at Northington, 
I had a ward full of guys there who had had plastic reconstructive surgery, Hoffman from Kentucky, and and uh, Harold B. Reed, I did 101st Airborne, uh, uh, Brazier, who had, had been a tanker and had severe burns, Caldwell, who had, had been a, uh, a waste gunner on a B-17, had flown all his missions. <clears throat> and a plane come in and shot up in England one day, and he jumped on the fire truck to go out with the guys to help get the crew out. And while they were out there working, the plane exploded, and he was covered with burning gasoline. He shouldn't even been out there. He was just waiting for transportation to come home on leave after his 25 mission. Uh, and Sarasi had uh, taken out some of the hair and from back here, and this is 60 years ago, and made him eyebrows. Uh, had tattooed in some eyelashes, had made him a nose, and had fixed his ears. And, where he had ears and uh, he had lost a leg. His leg was so badly burned, one of his legs had to take it off. Uh, but all of us had had each other. And we were together, regardless of what unit we came out of, we all had a problem. And all of us could pretty much look at a guy who was nearest and who we considered to have a more serious problem than we had. Before we get into Lou's rehab and baseball comeback, let me give you a quick review of his life before the war so you can understand the man he became. Lou Brissy grew up in Greenville, uh, South Carolina, and then moved to Ware Shoals when he was about 11. Ware Shoals is a, well, it was a cotton mill town. Lou's father, Lou Sr., was a white man in rural South Carolina who befriended a black man and became business partners with him. Uh, they operated a motorcycle repair shop. The Brissy family would end up leaving Greenville, South Carolina for war shoals after hooded Klansmen whipped Lou Sr. and then beat him on the ground, kicking him repeatedly before sticking a burning cross in his front lawn. Uh, they left Lou Sr. with broken ribs and a face full of lacerations, and unfortunately, this beating would ultimately cost Lou Sr. his life 10 years later. The damage done to his liver from repeatedly being kicked would kill him at the young age of only 44. But before that sad day, when the Brissies left for Ware Shoals, Lou Sr. became a mechanic at a cotton mill for the Regal Textile Corporation. In the late 1930s and 1940s, these cotton mill towns had their own baseball teams and leagues. By the time Lou was 14, he stood six feet two inches tall. According to the biography I read, uh, his saber profile says 6'4 at age 14. But either way, big kid, and he was pitching and playing first base for one of the mill teams. In his very first game for Regal Textile Mill against Greenwood Textile Mill, he struck out 17 of the first 19 batters he faced. By the time he was 16, he was already receiving interest from major league clubs. The big, powerful left-hander had a wicked fastball, and the Dodgers and the Philadelphia Athletics came calling. The Dodgers offered Lou $25,000, but education was important to the Brissies, and Lou took Connie Mack's offer to pay for Lou to go to school for three years, which at that time was long enough to get a degree before joining the Philadelphia Athletics. Uh, the first 11 years I lived in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, I lived in Greenville during the time in Greenville, I might mention that <clears throat> my dad had a, a very simplified, for the lack of a better term, uh, opinion of America and back in the late 20s and during the 30s while we were in Greenville. Uh, he believed that equal opportunity meant equal opportunity. And uh, he had some difficulty with the Klan and what I know was beaten on one occasion for that. But he believed that the, that the country stood for opportunity. 
And uh, then at, at, uh, shortly before my 12th birthday, we moved uh, his little cycle shop that he had, uh, went out of business, and we moved to Ware Shoal, South Carolina, which was a mill, uh, a mill town about 35, 40 miles south of Greenville. And that was probably the best thing that happened to me in my life. It was a, a small mill town with a very benevolent ownership. They probably had the best stadium in the southeast. It's beautiful. It's still in use today. Uh, we had major leg lighting system in the late 30s. There was no equivalent in the southeast at all due to the management, Mr. Ben Regal, who owned, owned the company. Uh, and it was there that I really got active in, in, in baseball. Up until that time, it had kind of been kind of a pickup thing. And, uh, but there they, they had a first team and second team and uh, playing that was sponsored by the textile company. And I started pitching with the, the number one team when I was 14. And uh, uh, then at 16 or 17, right after I finished high school, uh, I think I finished high school in May and my 17th birthday was in June, I went to Philadelphia and uh, signed an agreement with Mr. Connie Mack that he would send me to college. And uh, at the end of the third year of school, I would uh, report to the ball club directly to the, the A's. But school didn't last long before the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and sent Lou's destiny in another direction. Throughout Lou's hospitalization and rehabilitation, he received handwritten letters from Connie Mack encouraging him and promising him a tryout if he could work his way back to baseball. Connie Mack was pretty loyal to him, uh, giving him a chance to, to play when he got done, where a lot of teams probably would not have. Yeah, you have to you have to give him a lot of credit. I in his biography, they actually share some of the letters that Connie Mack wrote him. Whether or not Connie actually believed that Lou would make that recovery or not is, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's true or not. It, it's hard to imagine that a guy who has had twenty three operations and forty blood transfusions or whatever legitimately could pitch. Yeah. Uh, but like you said, to Connie Max credit, he gave him every opportunity. There was a there was a story about him. Um, it was either right before one of his operations or right after. But he went to go show that Connie Mack that he could pitch, and he was on crutches. And he was actually out there on the mound, like he tried to. He was using one crutch and then throwing the ball. <laughs> I don't know how that worked out, but it impressed the heck out of Connie Mack. <laughs> When asked if he was ever angry or disappointed in the price that he paid and its impact on his ability to play baseball, Lou had great perspective. All he had to do was look around him. Never thought about it. That didn't enter into the, to the consideration at all. And I don't think it entered into a lot of them. And I can name you Ernie White, left-hand pitcher for the Cardinals, shut out the 1942 Yankees in the World Series. And that was one of the great all-time Yankee teams. Uh, Ernie went on in service and ended up in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, he either got frozen feet or trench foot due to the cold wetness. When you can't keep your feet dry, you get what they call a trench foot, and, uh, which is serious. Uh, he came back and never could really pitch any, but Billy Southworth, whom I got to know, and, and Billy Southworth had lost a son in the Battle of the... Bo no, his son was a pilot. I'm not sure when he was shot down. Mickey Cochran, who was my coach in Philadelphia and a Hall of Fame player, lost a son in the Battle of the Bulge. He used to talk a lot about that. But Billy Southworth told me Ernie White was the best left-hand pitcher he ever saw while he was in Major League Baseball. So he was a pretty good pitcher. 
Uh, but he didn't hesitate and he went and came back and went into the management, managed ball clubs and coached and whatnot. But Ernie paid a great prize. John Grzycki, who was a right-hand pitcher for the Cardinals, uh, served in the 82nd the Airborne and was wounded and came back and tried, but he just couldn't make it. And of course, Bert Shepard, a lot of people know about Bert, who lost a leg as a pilot and had been a pitcher. And he came back and I think spent, spent a year with the Washington Ball Club with a prosthesis. And uh, so there were a lot of other examples as well. Bob Feller, uh, who enlisted on December the 8th, the morning of December the 8th, and uh, served through the entire war, I think, on the Alabama, uh, was another great example. I just think, you know, it, it just didn't enter into it. And these are people who were the game's greatest stars, and it just didn't enter into their, their line of thinking to protect their career. But I think that was, we had a unity of purpose in America then, and, uh, and that was to get in and get it over with and get home. In 1947, after years of rehabilitation and surgeries, he pitched in the Sally League in Savannah, Georgia. He was dominant, going 23-5 and five with a 191 ERA and 278 strikeouts. He pitched in Grayson Stadium, same stadium that Jackie Robinson played, Satchel Paige, Hank Aaron, and now the Savannah Bananas, which I highly recommend if you ever get the chance. That year in Savannah was all the proof that Connie Mack needed. Lou would be called up to the big leagues to finish the 1947 season, making his MLB debut on September 28, 1947. Even under the most mundane circumstances, MLB debuts are almost always nerve-wracking for the players. Lou had it much worse. He was thrown into it in Yankee Stadium in front of some of the game's greatest players that ever lived. And then the last day of the season in the American League, I went up and pitched in Yankee Stadium against the Yankees. Uh, I've often said I was probably the only major league pitcher who, who pitched the ball game with his mouth wide open because I, my jaw dropped, you know. It was also the first Babe Ruth day. It was not a formal day, but the babe had had throat surgery for cancer. And he was there in a top coat in the stands. And, th and they brought in all the great old timers, members of the Hall of Fame, uh, <clears throat> to play an old-timers game. Honest Wagner was there, Rabbit Marinville, uh, Grove, Dean, uh, all the great old-time Yankees that were living. Uh, just all of them were there. Cobb, Speaker, uh, Hornsby, I mean, and these were all people I read about when I was growing up, you know. We never saw them on television. Didn't hear much about them on the radio. But we read about them. So I was just in absolute shock, you know, that all these fellows I'd read about all my life were here and out there. It was just really phenomenal. I lost that game 5-2 to two and didn't do well. But uh, it was a beginning. On opening day of 1948, Lou was given the honor of starting the second game against the Boston Red Sox on Patriots Day. The other starter for Philadelphia was Phil Marchildon, who I talked about in my episode on POWs in baseball. Phil was a Royal Canadian Air Force gunner whose plane was shot down over Germany in August of 44. He was held as a POW at Stalag Luft III in Poland. Both Phil and Lou pitched complete games, and both won. One of the, which I think is one of the funniest stories, I don't know if, if you read this or, or saw it on my video or you've already talked about it. Um, 
uh, op opening day, 1948, it's, uh, it was a doubleheader <clears throat> against Boston. And uh, uh, Ted Williams comes up. Of course, Ted Williams, a veteran also. He comes up and he lines a hard shot up the middle that hits Brissy in his bad leg on the metal plate. And, of course, Brissy goes down. And he would have easily got a double, but he got to first base and Ted Williams called time. And he went over to see how he was. And Brissy looked up and he goes, uh, damn it, Ted, why don't you pull the ball? <laughs> and so about two months later, in late May, they're playing again. And uh, Brissy pitches and Ted Williams hits one over, I mean, just a sh towering shot over the light standard in right field. And as he's rounding first going to second, Brissy says, I didn't mean pull it that far, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, the more I read about Ted Williams, the more I like him. Uh, he he was he was a really caring person uh, for other veterans, Negro leaguers. Um, he just oh, yeah. he yeah. Um, so that's a great story. Yeah, um, you know one of the things I don't know if you're aware. Another thing that I found super interesting. Um, that they mentioned in his biography is is Lou's perspective on the Korean War. And it never really occurred to me that veterans of World War II, they sacrificed so much. And in their views, they were making that sacrifice so that the world would never have to go through this again. Right. And and then uh, yeah. just, just a few years later, we're back in it in another war. And... I think it was really tough on him uh, mentally and uh, never really thought about that before. You know, you think coming home after all that crap that they went through and sacrifices they made and lives that were lost. And you think, you know, at least, at least we've done something significant. This will never happen again. Five years later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, no matter where you were in the war for a, uh, World War II veteran to see that in you know Korea and in Vietnam after what they went through and they went through a lot no matter where they were but I mean I can't even imagine especially the ones that were in the Pacific theater because in Europe at least they kind of had I guess for the most part they did follow some rules I mean you know but in, in the Pacific theater they were just yeah man brutal brutal, brutal yes brutal is a great mm -hmm. word <laughs> Yeah, from the get-go, from the kamikaze pilots to the way they handled prisoners of war, it was a yeah. different, different kind of warfare uh, in Japan for sure. I kind of glossed over his path to the majors, and I, I want to emphasize how painful things were for Lou. He was pitching effectively, but between starts, there were days where he couldn't even get out of bed. His leg was in constant pain. He could not run more than a couple minutes. He wore a super thick brace under his uh, pants on his lower left leg, and he would spend every night soaking that leg in a bath, icing it, trying to ignore the pain. I also wanted to mention that opponents gave him no breaks. Uh, they tried bunting on him, but he was just mobile enough to effectively be able to field his position. At the start of the season in 1949, after four appearances, Lou had three complete game wins and one save. He was being used as both a starter and a reliever. His record stood at 9-3 with two saves by July 1, and he became an all-star that year. Lou was part of a three-way trade and was sent to Cleveland at the start of 1951, where he would finish his career in 1953. Throughout his life, Lou was very involved in veterans affairs. He visited hospitals regularly. He met with soldiers who served in the Persian Gulf and discussed the mental side of recovery. Back in the 1940s, as I'm sure you're aware, nobody knew anything about PTSD. As Lou once wrote in a letter to a friend, quote, Our battles were behind us and our dreams for our future still with us. It seemed so simple, but we would soon realize our battles were just beginning. We had changed, and we, not our families, were not prepared for those changes. Our coming home would not be as expected, for we would never be the same again. Many families would understand, many would not. 
And like all soldiers from all wars, the questions would begin. What's wrong? Are you okay? You're so quiet. Why do you always need to go somewhere? Why are you so angry? And we didn't have the answers. Lou suffered from nightmares for many years. He said, quote, you thought about where you'd been, what you'd done, what you'd seen, and what you didn't see. Bodies being torn apart, blown up. The screams of pain. No human could go through what we went through, saw what we saw, felt what we felt, and come back unchanged. Before I wrap up, I want to share one final clip of Lou talking about Connie Mack. He was just good, so good to me, and all he ever promised me was an opportunity. When I was wounded he, and he heard about it, he wrote me a letter. And he said, look, your job now is to get well and get back and get yourself straightened out. And when you're back and you think you're able to play ball, you let me know and I'll see you get the opportunity. He didn't say I'll guarantee you a job. Uh, he also said in that letter, something to this effect about of course you can continue your college which to me is saying look we're still going to honor our agreement if you want to go that route instead so i was just very very fortunate to have signed with him and been a part of his organization and to have the people in savannah and philadelphia and Cleveland for the teammates that I had. I was just a lucky man uh, with the good Lord's help along the way. Late in his life, Lou was part of a group working to get fellow South Carolinian Shoeless Joe Jackson into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Still a work in progress. I'm honored to own Lou's rookie card. It's not an expensive card, but it has significant value to me and has an honored position in my collection. Special thanks to Mike, the sports history collector. We recorded this on a Sunday night, and I'm grateful for him giving me his time. He's a great guy, and I hope you subscribe to his channel. I thought you might enjoy some of our banter, so instead of leaving it on the cutting room floor, I'm adding it here at the end. If you like or hate this part, I would be interested in knowing either way. Should I include off-topic stuff like this in the future? Leave me a comment. Every, whenever I do a video, if it's possible, I pick up a card. You know, some guys it's impossible. Uh, Ray Chapman, I, I think there's only a couple of Ray Chapman cards and they're like thousands of dollars. So that's yeah. But I did pick up this 4849 Leaf Lubrissy. Nice. Um, the neat thing about buying cards for, you know, the kind of guys that I do videos on is they're pretty cheap. Uh, and I get just as excited about this coming in the mail as any other card. So that's kind of nice. It's a nice way to be able to build a, a collection that has some meaning to me without, you know, breaking, breaking myself financially. But, it's the same with me. A lot of the cards that I get, even though I try to always find this uh, autographed cards mm -hmm. and even those, in that era, you're looking at $80 or lower, sometimes as low as $10, which works out really great, except for a handful that um, either the card itself was maybe a high number or the player passed away before a period of uh, autograph, you know, mm -hmm. time where people were getting more autographs. And those get kind of expensive uh so unfortunately, I'm up against that sometimes where the regular card would be like $12, $14, and then the autograph card would be $400. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I'm going to share the image that you sent me of your autograph, Brissy, which you also feature in your video. But how did you get that? Was that an eBay purchase? Yeah, that was an eBay purchase. That was actually a pretty easy one to find. Um, in fact, I almost pulled the trigger. Well, I tried to pull the trigger. Let's put it that way. On um, the, the the one you're showing is 52 Bowman, and I recently found 51, multiple 51s, but one that I liked the price on, and um, I really didn't think anyone else was going to bid on it, and I got outbid at the last minute. So, Wasn't one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> well. I was fascinated by him. Again, I hadn't heard of him before. Uh, he's got an incredible story. I think he, he kind of crosses a, a couple 
uh, or he his story intersects a couple of interests of mine. One, uh, like you, I think uh, I'm fascinated by guys who who served and then played baseball. Uh, so he crosses that. Uh, obviously, his story is significant because of the injuries he received. Um, but he also grew up in South Carolina in a cotton mill town. And that's kind of interesting to me because my son goes to the University of South Carolina. And he he lives in an old cotton mill house. So my son's house was built in 1900. And the cotton mill in that town opened uh, the building. It was called, it's called Olympia Mills. Uh, it was built in 1899. Uh, and if I don't know if you're familiar with the way the cotton mill towns work, but they these companies that own these cotton mills built housing for their workers as a, a way to attract people from like rural South Carolina to come to Columbia to work. So my son lives in one of these houses that's a duplex that was built over a hundred years ago to house mill workers. And uh, so that's pretty cool to me. That's real and, cool. Yeah. It's an interesting story. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> now, the 1910s and 1920s were they're heading into 1920. The cotton industry in the South was huge. And not to get, um, I, I can go off on these tangents, but <laughs> I just let me just say the 1920s was devastating to the cotton industry because of the boll weevil. I don't know if you're familiar with the boll weevil. Oh, yeah. So the boll weevil is an insect that crossed from Mexico into Texas over the Rio Grande sometime around 1920, and it started to move east. I think, uh, I don't know how many years it took for it to move all the way over to South Carolina, but it just completely devastated the, the cotton crops uh, because they, they lay their eggs in the cotton buds, and then when the, when the babies are born, they feed on the cotton, and then they have them. Uh. So completely wiped out the cotton industry and then the depression hit. So it was, it was just a, a, a horrible time for uh, cotton mills. It actually took, uh, uh, this is my last fact on cotton. It, t- <laughs> it took almost 50 years for them to eradicate that bull weevil. It was like ni- 1978 before the bull weevil was eradicated. So, they started to use DDT, which is toxic, but the boll weevil mutated and became resistant to DDT. So. <laughs> it's it's just a fascinating story to me. I wish we had Statcast to know because, by all accounts, what I read is that he was he was a hard thrower. So, you know, I can't imagine. I mean that that push leg is so important to get oh, yeah. off off the rubber and to, and to generate velocity. He must have just been he must have been gifted, you know, yeah. really gifted because uh, or I mean, incredible had an incredibly high pain tolerance, which I'm sure he did. Well, um, and you got to imagine whether whether he was in pain or he lost some strength in that leg. When you any any part of your body that you're compensating for, you're probably when you're a pitcher, you're going to compensate by throwing differently. And how many pitchers have we seen over the years that have compensated in their arm? They've hurt their arms, their rotator cuff. A lot of you know, back in those days, it was a dead arm, but mm-hmm. uh, we know now that it was you know more than just that. I, I know it's uh, Sunday night. We just watched the Braves lose game one sixty for us. So now we have a doubleheader tomorrow. Uh, is that for out. sure? You're for mm-hmm. sure playing it tomorrow. So where yep. where are you with the Mets right now? So the Mets, so the Mets, they have it rough, unfortunately. Um, so we're tied. Uh, it's a three way tie right now. Uh, Arizona, uh, the Mets, and the Braves are all tied. Did, um, um, Arizona hasn't finished playing today, have they? They won. They beat yeah. my Padres. <laughs> yeah. Darn it. So the Mets who were playing Milwaukee have to fly down to Atlanta tomorrow or tonight. We play tomorrow. Uh, if the Mets sweep or the Braves sweep, the Diamondbacks are in. Uh, if they split, then the Braves and Mets are both in. And uh, the Braves own the tiebreaker on the Mets. So we would play the Padres. Um, so we'll see tomorrow. Yeah, I'd rather play the Mets. I think I'm going to take a vacation day and go to the go to the stadium because uh, they're oh. selling tickets. Uh, you get to go to both games, so I think I'm I think I'm going to do it. Oh, that'd be uh, really cool. Yeah, this might be the end of the year for me because if they go out to San Diego, the whole wild card thing is out in San Diego. Like 
there's no travel. So they play all three games out there, assuming it goes to three. Um, so this would be it for me potentially. So I think I'm going to do it. Yeah, that was, that's interesting. Cause I was thinking, cause if, if, um, it, at some point it was going to be potentially the Padres playing the diamondbacks mm -hmm. in the, in the wild card game. And then we just played them. So it's like, yeah, we, we haven't been traveling and we just played the Dodgers. So that's not a lot mm -hmm. of travel for San Diego the last, you know, eight games. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're going to be pretty rested. And on the other note, the Dodgers are going to have their, they're going to have a buy, I guess, to play. And they are notoriously this time of year terrible when they've had rest. Yeah. So that's, that's going to be interesting. Yeah. Same thing with the Braves last year. Yeah, you want to play the Mets. Uh, I, I think you would want to have the Mets sweep the Braves tomorrow because they are in Milwaukee today. They were, you know, they were in Milwaukee for three. They have to fly to Atlanta tomorrow and play a doubleheader, and then they would have to fly to San Diego to play Tuesday. So, but either way, you know, the Braves are going to have if the if you end up playing the Braves, they have to split it at least, you know, at least win one of those games and then fly on a plane. So our pitching is going to be all out of whack, but. Uh, it's exciting, which is all I all I want out of the end of September. So, so they play a doubleheader tomorrow, and then they play again on Tuesday. Tuesday, yeah. Oh man, no, no, there's no no delay to the start of the wild card round. So, yeah, well, that didn't work out well. Didn't work out well, but uh, you know that's why the, the we 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 have one of the, the one of the few distinctions of of losing a series to the White Sox this year. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, you win one of those games against that crappy White Sox team and, and you're not in this position. So, yeah. But, well, it, it's been exciting from my point of view. I, I love this time of year. I love the wild card uh, yeah. the whole situation because if you look at it for most of the season, the Dodgers were running away with the, the West. Yeah. So for me as a Padre fan, without a wild card, we were just sitting back, except towards the end where we actually started gaining ground, gaining ground with the actual potential. We had it really in our own hands. We could have beat the Dodgers a couple more and then uh, and not dropped like today. We would have probably won the division, but eh, it's better than last year. But last year we had some really bad months. They just had losing months that were just terrible. It just, just sunk their whole season. But this year they've been very, very consistent. So, but I think we match up better against the Mets. I, I uh, even not rested. I, I worry about the Braves. The Braves can't score. So, I mean, if you look at runs scored and runs allowed, I think we have the the least number of runs allowed, but we also have the the least number of runs scored in the National League. It is. So, it's not good. The offense is garbage right now. So, without Acuna, without Austin Riley, and Matt Olson's having a bad year. Sean Murphy's Sean Murphy's not even hitting 200, so it's rough. But, yeah. Which means they'll probably win the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that always the way? <laughs> I mean, I, I look at the teams that we've had over the last few years. The team that won the World Series was an 88-game 88, 88 uh, winning team that year. Yeah. So who yeah. knows? You never know. Well, we had, Before they kind of changed up the, the whole thing, um, the wild card teams for a while there, they were actually winning the World Series, and because they weren't yeah. adjusting for the fact that it should be harder for them to go through the the playoffs yeah. rather than kind of be equal, so they kind of made that a little easier. Mike, before I end the recording, uh, do you want to talk about what's coming up on your channel? Um, I'm actually currently working on a video right now. It's uh, a non a World War II video. It's um, I'm going over the 1974 season with the, the Dodgers. For me, um, as a young collector slash fan, it was my first year uh, rooting for the Dodgers when I lived in L.A. Um, that they made the play uh, playoffs, yeah. And then they'd go on to make it to the World Series. But it was also a special year for me. 74 was my first year of high school, so things were changing for me. And, and it was my last real summer where I really collected real hard as a kid. And uh, so, you know, me and my friends. And so I kind of wanted to do something about that and a little bit about the play. I actually went to the playoff games by skipping mm -hmm. school. Shame on me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So uh, what's that's more what we're doing right now? Lifetime memory of that of that playoff game, or just another day in high school? Yeah, another high school day. Exactly right. I don't even remember most of those days now, but I remember that game, those games. <laughs> exactly. Good choice. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Appreciate it.